pleasure of having Dr. Ken Poller as our guest speaker. He got his bachelor's in science from UCLA in psychobiology and got his PhD in neuroscience from UC San Diego. Afterwards, he held postdoctoral positions at Yale, Manchester, and Berkeley, and is now a professor of psychology at Northwestern University, holding the position of James Padilla Chair in Arts and Sciences. Fun fact, his first publication is from 1983. Dr. Poller is currently studying cognitive neuroscience as the director of the cognitive neuroscience program at Northwestern. He also serves as the director of the training program in the neuroscience of human cognition and is a fellow at both the Cognitive Neurology and Alzheimer's Disease Center and the Center for Sleep and Circadian Biology. His research interests are primarily focused on human memory, perception, and cognition, and their implementation in the brain, as well as the biological basis of mental phenomena. His lab currently focuses on using lucid dreaming to better understand the dream world. His research has been featured in media many times, including NPR, PBS Nova, Scientific American, Science, MIT Tech Review, Forbes, and Psychology Today. Another fun fact, he even held a Reddit Ask Me Everything a couple of years ago to answer questions about sleep and dreaming. Are we ready to go? Okay, Dr. Paller, yep. you're up. Okay then, well, thank you very much for that nice introduction and covering the background, um, quite accurate for the most part. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's funny to think about my career in that way, but um, I, I note that I started out as a psychobiology undergraduate at UCLA and, and that was an interesting um, sort of area to get in because I, you know, I didn't know I was gonna do that when I started college, of course, and then, wandered around through some different majors and ended up with that one, which ended up being a nice basis, kind of a stepping stone to go from there to neuroscience and then back to psychology. So as you can see, I'm on the intersection of these two different big fields, neuroscience and psychology and cognitive neuroscience sort of uh, gives us the, the intersection of those and allows us to apply neuroscience methods to understand all about human, human psychology and various aspects of, of human behavior. So one of my messages today is probably uh, to, to, to advise you to, you know, to continue your scientific training, which is wonderful. I really, you know, from what I see about the program you're in this summer, it seems great. And you're getting sort of a lot of interesting perspectives and opportunities, but I, I think you should keep an open mind for what you can do in the future as you're taking these steps and learning about biochemistry and doing different projects, you're sort of gaining expertise in science that in the future you could apply to anything. You could you know, decide you wanna do science in some particularly different area. And so I think you know, these stepping stones that you take, uh, you wanna kind of not feel locked in. Uh, even even a, as a graduate student, you can still transfer or as a professor, you can still move and go into different fields uh, for example, I, I got into sleep research rather late. I was studying memory for a long time and then decided, well, sleep was something I'm also interested in and it connects. And, uh, you know, that's sort of a transition I made. And I think uh, uh, my advice is that you can, you can make transitions and go from one thing to another as you're sort of gaining, uh, uh, you know, specific expertise on working on, you know, a very focused project in biochemistry or something, and then also move on to other things from there. So, um, so, so my work is quite different from biochemistry, uh, and I'm going to show you um, some of my slides. I think you should be able to see that now. Is that correct? Um, yes. Great. And then one thing I want to do is uh, be sure I can see you guys because um, it's nice to see some people. So I'm going to put put you guys here so I can see you. And. Uh, and let you know that if you want to interrupt and ask me a question anytime in the midst of my talk, I'm quite happy to sort of take questions in the middle. They don't have to all wait till the end. So I, I changed my title a little bit here. Uh, so, you know, the neuroscience of memory is, is interesting for a number of reasons. And it's, my focus is on human memory, but the neuroscience of memory, of course, covers all perspectives on memory from the uh, molecular mechanisms of, of memory how memories are stored in neurons, how neurons are plastic, how they change, 
how the circuits can change as we store memories and all the way up to how brain systems work and how we can think about memory functions in humans. And as I'll talk about our, our ability to consciously relive the past, uh, kind of a mental time travel where you can sort of bring up an event from the past and in a way re-experience it again. Uh, so, so if you think about the neuroscience of memory, it spans this huge range, all focused on you know, different dimensions of, well, how does memory work? How do we actually store information? And, and in, in human uh, and other animals, how, what are the brain mechanisms that make that possible? And, and sometimes we think about computers and how do they store memories? What are other ways memories are stored in, in the world? Uh, and how, how is it the same? How is it different from how human memory works? So that's, that's part of how that's been interesting. And uh, as I mentioned, sleep has also become interesting for me. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna make that transition to sleep partway through my talk, starting with memory. But I noticed from something I heard from Susan and, and actually in your chat, you guys apparently aren't getting enough sleep. How can that be? Why are you working so hard and not getting sleep? So I, I popped in this, this first slide that um, uh, describes just basic stuff that people know about sleep hygiene, because I, I want to be sure you don't undervalue sleep. And in my work, I'm particularly thinking about how it's valuable for our daytime memory abilities and our problem solving abilities and so forth. But uh, there are lots of messages. You may have, you probably heard all these before, so I'm, I'm not going to spend much time on it. But sleep hygiene involves these various uh, steps you might take to be sure you get good sleep. And uh, so, so the bottom line there is, is you shouldn't sleep. You shouldn't think of sleep as a waste of time. <laughs> Obviously, you know it's a little necessary, but is it mostly dispensable or is it really important? I think it's it's actually quite important for health. It's important for mental function as well. And so uh, try to get done what you need to get done in, in the remaining hours of the day without sacrificing too much of your sleep. That's a, a little public service message here at the beginning. But let me move on then to, uh, to the topic of memory. So uh, I want to start with memory by looking at when memory goes bad. So within neuroscience, neuropsychology is... Uh, has, you know, it, it sounds like it's a combination of psychology and neuroscience, just like the term cognitive neuroscience, but it actually has a particular history and it's about what happens in brain damage to people. What are the deficits that they uh, encounter? And so uh, amnesia is one of the examples that, that has told us a lot about how memory works. And so I wanna give you a view of this patient, one guy in particular, he's, he's over here, uh, patient EP will get to meet him. He'll be interviewed by Alan Alda, who's uh, uh, an actor, a celebrity, and, and science uh, aficionado who's, who did this program, and also uh, Larry Squire, who's done some of the work on patient EP and also was my advisor in graduate school. So I'm, I'm going to show you his view on how memory breaks down in, in patients with amnesia. And so this is uh, patient EP, you should hear the audio. 1992, okay. retired from a career in electronics, he suffered an acute virus infection that destroyed part of his brain. Research and development, that's what I like. Most of his thinking skills survived the damage virtually intact. EP can also copy complex drawings. About it, huh? And he not only has no difficulty repeating back a list of words, E.P. really Chill. hits his stride when the testing of his cognitive Swing. skills involves Jen's laptop computer. Gold. Having been in electronics over the years, I am amazed at all this. It's just wonderful. Believe me, little printed circuits, just, oh, you can't believe it. It used to be in a six-foot rack, and down to this, it's just wonderful. When I was in electronics, this would be in a six-foot rack. But it's now that something odd about EP's behavior becomes apparent. Printed circuits, diodes, triodes, and all that stuff in there. Oh, it's just amazing, believe me. When I was in electronics, this would be in a six-foot rack. This would be in a six-foot rack. It would be in a couple six-foot racks. It would be in six-foot racks. This would be in a six-foot rack. And now look at it, down to this little printed circuits and so he's not aware that he's told us three or four times that he used to be in electronics 
that the, a computer used to fill a room and that now it's down to the size of a microchip. He, he's just not aware that he said those things several times. No, he? no, he tells us the same stories again and again. We've heard these stories before and yeah. we'll, we'll hear these stories again. <laughs> Do you? Sure, sure. <laughs> How much have you worked with him? We have probably visited his house 200 times. 200 times. And for him, is each time the first time for him? Well, you see, it's yes and no. It's clear that he does have a record of the experiences that are based on the habits, the interactions, the emotional values of the interactions, the fact that they've been positive and not negative. Uh, he certainly uh, lets us in the door faster. But although EP can't record new memories, old ones from the years before his hippocampus was destroyed are remarkably intact. He grew up in Hayward, California. How about your house on Castro Valley Boulevard to the Hayward Theater? Do you remember where the Hayward Theater is? Yes, uh, I would leave the house and turn to the right to A Street, That's down A Street, the street to Castro Boulevard, and turn to the left, and it's in the middle of the block, Hayward. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and if you didn't go down to A Street, if you instead took, you could take another street, oh, uh, what would you do? the center, Redwood Road. Uh -huh. uh, okay. Redwood Road would run right into it. Unbelievable. How about the um, public library, Hayward Public Library, from uh, your house? be the same thing going down A Street, and uh, then uh, A, you have to go to the left to B, and it's on the corner. He's got, I don't that, he's got that map part. in his head. Okay, so that's a, a quick little view of some features of amnesia. It was a much longer video, but I kind of trimmed it to just get some highlights for you. And so... So there's a few th a number of things embedded in there that I want to talk about and sort of bring out. But uh, to start off, he seems like a perfectly intelligent man. He can carry on a conversation. He's, you know, he's not suffering from a lot of cognitive deficits. So his deficits are kind of circumscribed. He has memory problems, but he doesn't have lots of other problems. So this is, you know, the kind of amnesia that's most informative. Of course, amnesia can occur together with lots of other deficits in many patients. But in his case and some others, it's very selective, just a memory problem. And that's, that's sort of one clue about the brain organization of memory that it's not, you know, memory can be hampered in this way without affecting, affecting all other kind of cognitive functions. And, and if you think for a moment, well, what if you had just a memory problem for faces and you had damage to one brain area that made it so you couldn't remember faces. Actually, if you have that brain damage, it also messes up your ability to perceive faces. You can't kind of tell faces one from another. So the perceptual functions and the memory functions are kind of overlapping. The same bit of the cerebral cortex is doing both of those things. So that's not quite the problem EP has. He, he has problems with remembering faces for sure, but actually his problems are more global. That's why the term global amnesia is, is countered. He can't remember things he sees or hears or tastes or spatial information. He has trouble with all sorts of information and yet he can perceive that information well. So the perception isn't messed up, but the ability to store information is. And it's sometimes called organic amnesia just to distinguish it from uh, another type of amnesia, sometimes called functional amnesia. And in that case, uh, well, it's different in every case you see, and those people might forget their name and their, uh, their whole life in a sense. And that's a much more rare thing. And it's not due to the same type of brain damage. It's, it's more of a sometimes called psychogenic problem that doesn't really tell us a lot about the brain organization of memory because it's, you know, all different possibilities are there. Um, so we're really talking about damage to a particular part of the brain uh, in patient EP was in the medial temporal lobe of the brain and, and including an area called the hippocampus. And it led to this aspect of uh, memory problem that's called antegrade amnesia. So you saw that when he kept repeating himself and he didn't remember that he had talked about knowing about electronics and how computers used to be big and fill up a room and now they're small on a laptop. And every time he looks at the laptop, it seems to bring up that knowledge. And he says it again without remembering that he said that before. So anterograde amnesia is defined as a difficulty learning new information and knowing what happened before. So that's his problem. He had his injury in what, 1992 
and then had this anterograde amnesia. You didn't see it here, but he also had some retrograde amnesia. He had some trouble remembering some things in the in the months or years prior to 1992. We'll talk about that a little bit later. That's sort of interesting that it goes together, uh, that you get both new learning problems as well as a little bit of retrograde amnesia, but note that it's, it's not his whole prior life. So he has much very preserved memory for his childhood. And as you saw, he knew his home in Castro Valley and was able to describe how you'd get from one place to another. So he had an intact map of his childhood home. And, you know, he knew about his early life, his job is in, ele in electronics. So he didn't lose much of that old stuff, the memories that had been there for a long time. He only lost some of the more recent ones and the ability to create new ones. In fact, he had trouble getting around his new neighborhood where he was living. Uh, and so, you know, spatial processing seems bad, but not in a general sense, because he has the ability to do that for these preserved, what we call remote memories. So uh, to summarize that, 1990, uh, 19 I'm gonna go ahead here. Uh, he has what we call circumscribed amnesia, just a very specific deficit. And it's really not all types of memory. So that's an important principle. And the type of memory he has the most problem with is this recall and recognition of facts and episodes. Uh, sort of the, the episode of having said, I, I used to be an electronics engineer and now computers are smaller than they used to be. He, he doesn't remember that episode or many of the episodes of uh, his daily experiences. Now, amnesia has been studied for a long time. So here, look, 110 years ago, and, and, and even in the 18th, 1800s, there were studies of amnesia describing some of the features. And one of the interesting features actually was noted by this Swiss neurologist, Clapperhead, and he, he did the following thing, which, which isn't something we do to patients these days, but he hit a pin in his hand. It was kind of sharp, and then he shook hands with the patient, and the patient didn't like that, it hurt, and she kind of pulled back. And then his experiment was, well, the next day he went to the patient again and outstretched his arm to shake hands, and she didn't want to. But she didn't, she didn't seem to remember the episode but she said, well, you know, I, I just don't wanna shake your hands today. She made up some other explanation, but clearly she had a memory for that episode, but it's, it's not of the full conscious sort. It was sort of an unconscious memory where she had a feeling, you know, maybe shaking hands isn't a good idea. And that was the beginning of what's been elaborated, you know, more recently to understand, well, there are different types of memory, some of which are conscious and we know what we remember, and others influence what we do, but we're not really aware of that, the fact that we have a memory for that information. So let me uh, put the right side of this slide up because it's always important in neuropsychology to ask, well, what's the impairment and what's preserved in the patients? Because that says, you know, even with that brain damage, the remaining parts of the brain can do just fine in many ways. So as you saw, uh, EP is intelligent. He has this working memory, capability, which means he can keep information in mind at the moment and work with it. He knows what the conversation is about. He knows what's going on in the present moment. He could even like use working memory to add some digits together. So he's fine keeping information in mind. It's only once the information is no longer in mind, bringing it back was difficult for him. Uh, and you saw, you know, language abilities, attention, all sorts of cognitive functions are working just fine. And importantly, uh, his, his uh, ability to recall facts and episodes, well, it's not completely damaged because he's recalling his childhood in Castro Valley and riding his bike around. And so he remembers his young adulthood and, and childhood just like the rest of us, it seems. Uh, so remote facts and episodes are difficult, but uh, anything more recent since his injury, that's his impairment. So that brackets his impairment a little bit. And then the other way is that there are a set of other types of, I can call them unconscious memory. I'll, I'll give you another term for that in a moment. He can learn skills. He can acquire habits. He can do uh, conditioning and, and be changed by some, you know, conditioned uh, uh, responses that might happen to him. And these are, these are memory too. They're just not quite the same as remembering a fact in episode or, or recalling what happened earlier, but you engage in the skill and you can just do it without having to remember, well, where did you learn it? 
at what are those examples of learning? So now we have the understanding that, well, different brain mechanisms are at work allowing these different types of memory to work. And this last one is kind of interesting, priming. So I'll, let me give you a specific example of what, what, do, what do we mean by priming when we talk about priming in amnesic patients. So here's an experiment I did when I was in uh, Manchester in the UK as a postdoc and uh, had this experiment uh, with my, my mentors there. And uh, people would come into the laboratory and they would see a list of words, you know, maybe 30, 40 words, one at a time in the study phase. So that's the learning part. And then in the test phase, one of the things we did is a priming test where we had the computer show words real briefly. So you'd see the ampersands and then a word and then the ampersands again. The word would be on the screen maybe 50 milliseconds or 100 milliseconds. So very brief, it makes the word hard to read. So the word flashes real quickly and then is masked by the, the subsequent stimulus, difficult to read. And our question was, well, how is the reading ability changed when it's a word that you saw previously compared to if it's a word you know, but you didn't see it very recently. And that's, that's how we define priming in this experiment. And it's shown in the data here. You can see, well, this was results from nine amnesic patients, like AP, not, not quite as severe amnesia as EP, and nine people of the same age and education that we also tested. And for the dark blue bars, you can see that if it's a word they saw previously like piano in this example, 90 to 95% of the time they're getting that word correct. So they can word, read a briefly presented word, but if it's just some other words that were, we'll call them unprimed, words that didn't appear in the study phase, down to 50 or 60% correct. So those are the, you know, we made it hard. We made it specifically hard so they couldn't read those words. But interestingly, they're better at the words they saw recently in the amnesics get a perfectly fine benefit too. So their priming effect, their uh, ability to read these recently presented words is better. So it's like their, their visual cortex, the parts of the cortex that respond to words kind of have a memory for that word that allows that word to be read more efficiently and they're able to make it out and say what word it is on the screen. But of course, if we ask them to remember what words were presented, the amnesic patients are gonna be bad. And we, we did that actually in a, in a subsequent test. We show three words on the screen and we say, which of these three words did you see previously? Uh, our controls are, are nearly perfect on that. And the amnesic patients, well, they're not quite guessing, which would be 33% correct if they were just forced to pick one without any information. So they have some information, but they're quite impaired. So whereas they have an impairment in recognition, they're perfectly normal at priming. So clearly the brain damage didn't disrupt this type of memory, but it did disrupt this type of memory. And so that's, you know, the, the, this has been seen many times in my experiment and, and dozens of others to show that uh, amnesic patients really don't lose the ability to have memories. They just learn, lose a certain type of memory that depends on those brain areas damaged. And, uh, but it can survive and do fine. So just in the cortex, for example, and for skills, it's different parts of the brain. For habits, you know, we have ideas about which other parts of the brain are involved. And that's pretty interesting too. Um, and just quickly, one other example is when the words flash briefly, we also had them rate. Well, how briefly was that word flashed? Was it like really, really fast or just kind of fast? And here are the results from that in this bar graph at the bottom. And you can see that uh, the primed words were rated as if they were on the screen longer. So when they made the duration estimate, they gave a number that reflected them thinking it was on the screen longer, but it wasn't. So all these words were on the screen at the same time on average, but uh, they read the words and they were perhaps more efficient reading the words. And then they made this unconscious inference. Well, that word was a little easier to read, must have been on the screen longer, even though it wasn't. So that's also another influence of prior experience, a memory effect, we'll call it a priming effect. Uh, and it's normal in amnesic patients. So it, it again shows that priming can be preserved even when recognition and recall are, are no good. So going back to our prior slide, we have the impairment, which I'm gonna call declarative memory. That's a common term for this type of memory that they have trouble with. And preserved memory, now I'm gonna just collapse them. Sometimes we call this non-declarative memory just to say, well, it's, it's not declarative memory. 
It's also sometimes called implicit memory because these types of memory, you don't have to know you know that information. You just demonstrate the ability to you know, read the word or show the skill. And so it's implicit, perhaps without any conscious knowledge that that knowledge has been gained. It's unconscious knowledge. And so that's uh, our interesting classification. Now we can say, look, the brain systems that allow us to have this conscious type of memory, declarative memory, are different from the brain systems that do this other type of memory. And that is sort of the beginning road of now trying to understand how it works in the brain. And um, I think there's, there's a little metaphor, which is cutting nature at her joints. So sometimes in science, we wanna sort of categorize things. What are the different things there and which ones are different and which ones belong in the same category? And if we're doing that correctly, we're, as they say, carving nature at her joints. So that's our understanding of these different types of memory, uh, if we did it right. But, but there's a little more to it because you know, in our day-to-day -day life, sometimes when we're learning a skill, we also remember some facts. Like if you're getting taught how to play tennis, you might have the fact that your teacher told you, okay, hold your wrist in this particular way as you follow through on your swing. And so real life skill memories happen together with declarative memory. We kind of need both memory systems to do well in skills. Like if you're learning how to juggle, you get some advice about, well, exactly when do you wait to throw the next ball and how do you move your hands to do the juggling? So not every skill is implicit. <laughs> some of them have these other components and we think about both memories working together. In another sense, sometimes the unconscious knowledge we have can influence our ability to find something familiar. And, and I've studied that, it's kind of interesting. If I ask people, which of these two colorful kaleidoscope images did you see before? Uh, you, you actually seen one of them before because my title slide had one of them. <laughs> so you might not remember that, but if you guessed, you might guess correctly. And we found that people can guess correctly. They can have knowledge without realizing they have it and get this sort of an unconscious memory, which we think of as the priming kind of crossing over the line and interacting, it's kind of crosstalk between these different types of memory here. So, uh, so I would say, yes, we're trying to carve nature at her joints, but we also have to understand that actually these separate things, you know, in science, we take a thing and we say, let's study that one thing and block everything out, hold everything else constant so it doesn't interfere and study that one thing, which allows us to understand that one thing, in this case, you know, declarative memory. But then we have to understand, well, actually in plenty of circumstances, it's not isolated from other stuff. These things work together and we have to sort of put the parts back together and see how they work in normal circumstances, you know, outside of our controlled laboratory conditions, how do things really work? And so that's part of, you know, we have these different types of memory, but we also need to understand how do they work together when we're not carefully trying to pull one apart and, and studying it separately. So that's sort of a fun part of studying memories, thinking about, well, what, what, what allows us to have a conscious experience? So it's a, a bigger question in neuroscience is the neuroscience of consciousness. What makes us experience stuff? Uh, it could be perceptually, how do we experience things and have a conscious experience of that, which is different from a subliminal experience where something cuts in and you don't even realize it. And so this is in the memory realm, we can also look at that and we have this you know, reasonable way to think about well, there's the conscious experiences of memory and the unconscious ones that we can compare and think, well, what's special about the brain mechanisms that allows us to consciously re-experience the past? So that's one of our ideas. And the, the, to put it in a, in a bigger sense, we have this whole category of, um, oh, I think, I think one of my screens is stuck. Are you seeing a picture that says um, explicit knowledge and implicit knowledge? Good, okay, yes. so you're seeing the screen. No, one of my screens went dead. Okay, so, um, so both of these types of knowledge influence what we do, our thoughts, our decisions, our actions. And you know, think about decisions for a moment. You know, sometimes you might decide uh, an item to buy at the store or something. And you make that decision and you think, well, I'm doing it based on my conscious knowledge of what I'm doing. But implicit knowledge also influences our decisions. You know, another one is with implicit social bias. When you deal with people, different genders and race, you might have some generalities that you've carried with you, some stereotypes that, you know, you might 
not even want that to influence how you interact with other people, but it might do so without your knowledge. And so that's why we talk about implicit social biases when we're influenced by things without consciously knowing that it's happening. And so these, these both kind of types of knowledge can influence our, you know, from memory and from perception can influence how we behave, what we do. And of course, what we do goes back and influences memory storage because these networks, I haven't talked about the plasticity of neurons, but the idea is, you know, whenever you're using the brain, the networks of your brain can change. And, you know, as you do things repeatedly, you're causing changes and going back and influencing memory storage. And then, as I mentioned in the prior slide, well, actually, these two aren't quite so separate. So there's crosstalk between the implicit and explicit, and that's part of understanding this, this whole big story. So that's sort of a big picture of uh, a few of my favorite ideas in memory research. But let me go on now to um, this related talk of asleep. So how is sleep related to memory? That's not traditionally been part of what we study with memory, but I think it's pretty interesting. And here's one way to think about it is, you know, at the end of a day, if you, if you write a diary entry, if you just, you know, before you go to bed, if you think, well, what did I do today? And you kind of run through the various things you've done. You can most remember a lot about your day's activities. So, you know, what's today? It's, you know, Thursday. Uh, so think about what you did so far. Well, it's early in the morning, so it's not quite a good example. But imagine it was the end of the day. You could think about a lot of things. And if I instead said, well, let's take, you know, two weeks ago, Tuesday, what did you do? you know, you're not going to be able to run through anywhere near the detail that you can get from today. So we seem to have memories about our daily activities, but then in time, those kind of fade and we can't get that information out. So we, we kind of, you know, of all the things we could potentially remember that happen to us every day, we seem to store some of it well, and some memories actually endure quite well. So one of the questions in memory is, well, what, what makes those memories endure? And I think, you know, we think about learning as not just a one-shot deal where you get some new information and it sticks in your brain. You know, if I, if I drag a file from my, you know, a thumb drive onto my hard drive of my laptop computer, it's there and I can go get it later. When you put new information in, you know, if you're learning a new language, say, and you're learning these new words, I think for most of us, it takes a lot of effort to actually acquire all the new words of a new language. It doesn't just happen overnight real quickly. And so learning is a protracted process where of course you have, to, you have to study, you have to practice information to get it in. So that's part of the story of memory and memories enduring. And in memory research, we use this term consolidation to talk about how that works. Like when something happens, it, 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 it doesn't necessarily stick right in the brain, but there are gradual changes in the brain networks that allow memory storage. And I'm gonna connect this back to retrograde amnesia. So why does EP and other amnesic patients, they have a brain insult, and then some of their recent memories are lost? Well, it's because those memories have to undergo consolidation over weeks, months, maybe even years to have solid memory storage and brain networks. And so this consolidation process takes some time and can be disrupted you know, with brain damage uh, at any particular point in time. So this, this is happening over gradually over time and it's, a, it's partly about rehearsal. So as you know, if you wanna learn a skill, you wanna get better at something, you have to practice it or any sort of new knowledge that you're acquiring, you have to rehearse it. You know, If you learn new people's names, they're not just gonna be there for you automatically. Uh, you're gonna have to revisit those names and actually memorize them. And that, that takes practice. And, and we think about it, the rehearsal of doing that, which you can do intentionally, say when you study some material for a class, for a test you wanna learn, intentionally you do it. But we also do it unintentionally, just, just reactivating that information in conversations. You know, if you, if you get some new concepts you're learning in biochemistry and then you explain them to one of your parents, that's helpful because you're then bringing it up and working it through and explaining it. So unintentional rehearsal is good too. And then, well, I think unintentional rehearsal happens every night while we're asleep. And so that's sort of the new idea as well. It's, it's happening when you don't even realize it's happening. And that's part of effective memory storage. Uh, and as you do that, what's happening on a cognitive level, you're kind of taking that new information and integrating it with what you know. 
connecting, making connections between the new stuff and things you already know, making some generalizations that are going to help you with categories you formed, in fact, transforming the information. So information just isn't static like the file I put on my laptop computer, but it's, it's changing now and getting connected to other things. And in fact, allowing for creativity as you see interesting connections between things. So that's a big concept of consolidation. Now we think, well, that consolidation can happen during sleep too. So let me tell you about how we study that in, in my lab. Uh, so people can come in and here's a, a couple people, uh, James and Susan demonstrating the method. We can have them put on this cap that has these little um, white uh, connections on them. These electrodes that allow us to record the electrical activity of the brain. So they're sitting on the scalp, they can record the activity of the brain and then people can learn some stuff and then have a nap, uh, sleep in the lab. And we get these recordings, these little wiggles of EEG recordings. This is the electroencephalogram and allows us to make some inferences about what's happening. And interestingly, your brains are busy the whole time during sleep. You know, my laptop is shutting off when it goes to sleep, but our brains don't do that. They're continually active. And the question has been, well, what is that brain activity about? You know, it's, it's, it's obviously partly about revitalizing our abilities, you know, not being sleepy and, and you know, being restored when you wake up from a good night's sleep. But, what, you know, that's, that's not the full story about what's happening with the brain activity. So we've been analyzing that brain activity and trying to learn some more about how that works. And one of the ways I've been looking at it is with this method called target of memory reactivation. So uh, a number of my students did this together in 2009 where people had to learn some information and they learned where objects go on a screen. So there are 50 objects like a cat that came with a meow sound and 49 other objects. They had to learn exactly where each one went. And so they practiced a bit, got good at that. And then we gave them a test to see how well they learned. And then they went to sleep and we monitored their EEG and notice the different sleep stages that you can notice. There's slow wave sleep is uh, the deepest stage of sleep. And so we, we wait until they're in this deep slow wave sleep. And then we present half of the sounds and we present them softly so they're not waking people up and people don't know what happens. They wake up, they don't realize sounds were presented, but that's a uh, part of the thing that, uh oh, did something just happen? Or are we still good? Are you seeing my screen again? Not anymore. Not anymore. Okay, let's see if I can, should I share again? Yes. Okay. Or do you want to ask a question? <laughs> I haven't let you ask questions yet. This, uh, Great, yeah. Um, our Q&A folks, do you, is, is there a question you can bring up? Team five? Um, sure, we can um, start with Yana's question. She asked that the most common recommended time for sleep seems to be from seven to nine hours, but most of her peers sleep for six hours if they're lucky. Is there any result of this on generational productivity or cognitive abilities? How, and also, how close is lucid dreaming to hypno, hypnosis? I've heard you cannot be influenced to do anything you consciously are not willing to do. Is that true? And if so, why does this limitation change with lucid dreaming manipulation? And if you need me to repeat any of those questions, feel free to ask. Okay, uh, that's, that's sort of a lot of questions. So I guess we can get started kind of gradually here. Um, and I should try to share my screen again just to see if that, that's gonna work. So do you see this, this colored drawing now? It's coming up. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So uh, how much sleep is needed? You're right, You know, seven to nine is a general principle, but not everyone needs the same amount. So some people can get by on less sleep, but sometimes they get by and they're really you know, not functioning optimally during the day. So I think there are some consequences. There are some good epidemiological studies showing the consequences of short sleep as it's called. So I think, yes, that there are some detrimental problems there. And um, I think that was part of your question. Is there, is there good evidence that it's, that getting not enough sleep is harmful? Yes, <laughs> there is some evidence of that. Um, but, but again, exactly how much sleep is needed, it varies from person to person. So there's, there's not the same amount. Um, and the next question was about lucid dreaming. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So um, 
you know, I think I'd like to wait until we get to that topic. So I'm go, I, I might have to jump ahead giving the time here because I see it's, it's gone uh, longer than we expected. But let me, let me get to our work on lucid dreaming and then I can, I can, um, I can get to that, that question. So let me finish with this experiment that I started now that my, you see my slides again, I hope, right? Okay. So, uh, so we presented the meow during sleep, during deep sleep, mind you, slow wave sleep, and then test their memory when they wake up. And here's our main result just in this one bar graph. So you can see that uh, this is how much you forget. So people aren't as good at knowing where the objects go and they get worse generally. But if we presented those sounds during sleep, they pretty much don't forget very the locations as much. So we're showing that these sounds are presented and they're not blocked out. They actually had an influence and they prevented people from forgetting that much. So in other words, if you reactivate information during your sleep, it helps you maintain that information and be able to remember it later. So this sort of proves that that memory activation is, is, is operative in how we learn things. And uh, again, this was provoked memory activation, but there's other studies, other lines of research that suggest that this memory activation happens all the time, even when sounds aren't presented. So we think that, you know, a normal night of sleep has reactivation of recent things you've learned and the integration of that with other information. And we're still trying to figure out, well, how do we measure brain activity to show that that's happening? And, you know, if you're only sleeping four hours, maybe your brain's just really good at doing it. <laughs> so you get everything done quicker than a person that sleeps eight hours. But, you know, that's not necessarily the case. And I think we need to work on that a bit more to kind of figure out how, how memories are, are, are failing. So the bottom line from this is, Individual memories can be strengthened during sleep. And it's not necessarily learning new things during sleep that we're studying, although that's another interesting research topic. We're studying how it builds on what you do during waking learning. And we've, we've, we actually uh, wouldn't have done this work if we believed the dogma at the time. So in 2009, a lot of people believed that auditory information is just gonna be blocked and not get in. But we did this experiment and showed that no, it does get in it influences memory function and sleep seems to help with memory storage, therefore, because of this, um, this, this aspect of storing memories. So uh, this is too for declarative memory. I'm gonna pass over some other slides, but I'm gonna show that, well, it's also true for non-declarative memories like skills and habits. So take my word for that. <laughs> and uh, so I can move on to the lucid dreaming stuff. And, um, well, let me just, I'll just tell you what the skills are. So here's a skill that's uh, the Guitar Hero game. If anyone played that, so you have to press those four buttons. If you press the four buttons, you get to hear the melody. And so our experiment with that showed that if we present a melody during sleep, people are better at the musical performance of performing that melody when they wake up compared to if we hadn't presented that melody during sleep. And then the skill one is uh, this, uh, implicit social bias that I mentioned earlier. And in our study with from the Chao Sheng Hu did, uh, we also showed that presenting reminders of training to have a less, you know, you can reduce your bias by being exposed to counter stereotype information. In this case, for example, there was a gender bias that women don't do science. And so we pushed against that by pairing science terms with female faces and showed there was an effect of that that then got strengthened during sleep. So skills, habits, all sorts of memories might be important and, and activated during sleep. And uh, I wrote about this in Scientific American, but also in this other interesting journal you might look at called Frontiers for Young Minds. And it's a journal that's uh, specifically for kids. And my paper in that was called, Do House Elves Clean Your Brain While You Sleep? And this is a fun metaphor, because if you think about it, you know, you learn lots of information during the day and it, you know, makes a big mess in your brain. And to use that optimally, you kind of have to organize that information. And so during sleep, that might be part of the cleaning up, the organization of all the information, the drawing of connections between different things that might be connected and allow you to have, you know, an organized memory storage so you can access it well later. So that's sort of a, a fun little metaphor for how this works during sleep. So we're still studying, you know, how to understand the, the brain signals that index this memory storage and how to actually use this in applications that we might want to. And one of the applications is dreaming. So, 
here's this the last part is a little bit about dreaming so we all dream every night not all of us remember our dreams and most times when we're in a dream we think it's reality and you're wandering around doing stuff and you think it's real and then you wake up and you realize oh that was just a dream but now and then as some of you perhaps know you can have a dream where you realize it's a dream at the moment of the dream that's called a lucid dream so if you understand that it's a dream and stay asleep in the dream you can experience this world that now you understand is all manufactured by your brain and you're you realize well, actually i'm laying down in my bed somewhere but i'm also wandering around in this dream world that's imaginary that's a manufactured world and then this lucid dream is is sort of a different kind of perspective and we can provoke people to have a lucid dream and then communicate with them. And we can do this communication by using our electrophysiological recordings. So here you see EEG recordings from different locations on the head, as well as we put electrodes near the eyes and we can measure when people move their eyes around. And here they're making a signal. What the person's doing is looking to the left and to the right and left and right. And when we see that, we see these four little peaks here, here. So that's actually two, two left, right movements that they've made and we can measure that and therefore communicate with someone because when you're in a dream, you can't talk. Usually you're, you're, and we see that here in this black trace here, this is the electromyogram, the muscle activity. And REM sleep is defined by when your muscle activity is really reduced. So that means that you're, you're basically paralyzed. You have muscle atonia. You can't move most of your muscles, but you're still breathing. You're, and you're, you're still, you know, alive and your eyes are still able to move so it's called rapid eye movement sleep because the eyes move quite a lot so that's what we chose to do to, to try to do communication and you may have looked at this paper uh, but if you didn't it's it's karen uh, a grad student in my lab published this uh, earlier this year uh, demonstrating something that wasn't thought to be possible for real-time two-way communication during REM sleep and here's our one interesting example of that so you can see on the left you can see uh, wake recordings, and you can see that the EMG, this is recording muscle activity from the chin, it's showing a fair amount of muscle activity. And then during REM sleep, that's a really smaller line, less muscle activity. That's the muscle atonia that I was talking about. So this person was in REM sleep, and they knew that the, the person was named Christopher, and he knew, okay, if I realize I'm in a dream, I want to signal to Karen with three left, right eye movements. So I'm going to go left, right, left, right, left, right. If I realize uh, I'm in a dream. And we also provoked that dream by presenting some sounds that told Christopher, hey, right now, check to see if you're in a dream or not. So he got used to checking, and, which is something you don't normally do. You're in a dream and you don't think, I wonder if this is a dream. You know, that idea seldom comes up. Uh, but it, it did for... Christopher because of the practice and he realized, you know, I'm dreaming right now because I'm in my favorite video game, actually in there messing around as if I was in the environment of the video game. And he realized this must be a dream. So he made the signal three left rights, basically saying I'm having a lucid dream, but he couldn't talk because his, you know, muscles are paralyzed, but he could still move his eyes, make that thing. And Karen at the time realized that was true. So, uh, decided, okay, I'm gonna ask him a question and see if we can communicate. And let me ask a question where the, the correct answer is well known. So we can decide if he's answering correctly. Uh, but we're doing this research partly so we can investigate dreaming and eventually ask questions that we don't know the answer to, like, what are you dreaming about right now? And how do we, how do we connect that to brain activity? So she asked this question where we knew the answer, eight minus six, and here's Chris answering two. She asked another question here, he answered correctly again. So this was our demonstration, one of several demonstrations in our paper of successful communication. It, it showed that if we present words very softly, people don't wake up, but they get integrated into the dream. And Christopher's in his dream and he's hearing this voice that he realizes that's Karen asking me a question. So he answers the question with his eye movement signals again. So it shows that, you know, in your dream, outside information can get in there a little bit, and then you actually have the ability to think logically, to do a little math problem, and then to express the answer to the person you're talking to and have you know, a dialogue. And so that's what we demonstrate in this experiment. 
uh, this next figure just kind of shows it more pictorially. Uh, you're sleeping, you're dreaming about being in some other room. This uh, question comes in, you give the answer and you can answer with your eye movements. We can also get answers from breathing, from muscle twitches. There are a few different ways to get answers from people, not quite talking. So we're not getting full sentences, but we can at least ask some questions and get some answers. And in our future work, we're gonna ask, you know, what other type of questions can we get, can we ask people? So there was a question about lucid dreaming. Let me see, is it here in the chat? Um, in lucid dreaming, does the dreamer exert, this is Ed, Edward's question, any control over the environment they're imagining? And the answer is sometimes yes. So I define lucid dream here as people do as realizing that you're dreaming. But once you get to that state, many lucid dreamers find that it's possible to change the dream and to will something to happen. They can say, you know, I'm struggling with this this math problem, let me go talk to Einstein and see what he thinks the answer is. And they could go, I think Einstein's in the next room. They walk into the next room and there he is. So you can you can make things happen creatively in your dream, you know, not with complete control. So lucid dreamers describe it as well. I can't just make Einstein materialize, but you know, if I go in the next room, maybe he's gonna be there. And, and they can sort of sometimes make things happen, but yet not completely, which is interesting because well, who's generating the story of your dream? Well, it's it's in your brain somewhere happening it, but you, you, you get this ability to control some things and not others. So in this case, you know, we we incorporate we had them incorporate the little math problems we gave them in their dream. And so they were hearing that. And you know, we could have given them in future studies, we will be giving them instructions of have a particular experience and let's monitor your brain activity while that happens and see. How is that similar to waking experiences? How is it different than waking experience? So I think we've kind of opened the door to more scientific studies of dreaming than were possible before when we just had to rely on people waking up sometime later and telling us about their dream. Now we have another source of evidence about dreaming to use to try to understand more, you know, why do we dream? What does it have to do with memory processing? If, you know, what is, is it useful, adaptively helpful to be dreaming? Uh, and uh, so those are, the, those are the interesting questions we can get to. So to, let me just finish off and then we can take some more questions because I see I'm almost out of time. The, uh, I talked about all the different types of memory and the fact that our targeted memory reactivation can influence different types of memory opens the door to applications. So we can think about how could these methods help us take more advantage of the sleep, the sleep consolidation that's normally happening and that's good for us. And so many, you know, habit learning, many sort of ideas of learning, some clinical contexts are also important. So we're thinking about when people, and we actually have a new project in this, when people have a stroke, there's some brain damage, and yet there's ability to recover afterwards with therapy and with effort over months. And we're wondering, well, if they are learning how to use their brain in a different way to cope with their brain damage, can we make that learning happen more effectively by adding in the sleep component to make sleep work for them better. So that's one example of, of trying to apply what we're learning in, in a clinical context to help patients. And a last other example is problem solving. So, so I think sleep is important for learning, but le it's not just so we can reminisce about the past, but it's so we can use our knowledge to do things we need to do, one of which might be problem solving. And so one last experiment here I'll tell you about is uh, Kristen Sanders, a, a PhD student working with Mark Beeman, did this fun experiment where she gave people little puzzles like this one is, you see these uh, black uh, circles, move three of them to make the triangle face down instead of up. And we give people like two minutes to solve it and sometimes they'd figure it out and sometimes they wouldn't. And we were happy when they didn't figure it out because we wanted to have problems that they couldn't solve before sleep and see if we could change how well they could solve it after sleep. So here's the answer to that one. You move three pacing down. She had like tons of, you know, dozens of problems like that. So her experiment was she gave people, oh, did my slide stop again? No, oh, okay. Oh, you're good. You're saying it, great. So um, 
Before sleep, she gave them problems like, you know, here's a matchstick example where you have to move, you know, two matchsticks to make another triangle or something. So she gives them six problems they fail to, to solve in the two minute time. And then they go to sleep and she plays music tracks that were connected with just three of the problems. So now we have overnight sleep where you're working on those three problems because we, we picked which three problems without you knowing it, you're gonna work on. They wake up, they have to solve the problems. And here's their, the final results from the study where if we cue them to solve the problem during night, well, actually, if we just played the associated sounds, music file that went with the problem, they were more likely to solve those problems that went to 30% correct compared to only 20% if we didn't present it. So this shows that memory reactivation during sleep improved their ability to solve problems. And we think that's an important function of sleep as well is to work with information, you know, whatever's bugging you, the interactions with friends that you want to improve, you know, you're, you're you bring that information up while you're asleep and the other potential solutions can get jiggled around and maybe help you be able to come up with a solution. And, you know, maybe the next day you're going to get the solution. And that's kind of what happened in this experiment. So we think that's sort of an important part of sleep as well, that's worthy of, of further study to see, well, how can we harness that? You know, if we get, if we get people to focus on, you know, because normally you don't have any sounds during sleep. So you're going to work on problems, but which ones? Or are you just going to be rehearsing, you know, the, the, the uh, funny book you just read or, you know, the commercials you saw on TV, what's it going to be? So can we sort of have some more control over this important memory processing during sleep is an interesting uh, future direction. And with that, I want to thank all the students uh, that I've listed a lot of their names along the way and my mentors and my collaborators and the funding agencies that make this work possible that I've listed here on the right. And because uh, that's an all, you know, uh, kind of group group efforts of all these uh, experiments in this research that I've been talking to you about today. So that's where I'll end. And uh, hopefully you have some questions that we can uh, talk about at this point. Shall I start Wonderful. with the ones in the chat? I think what we'll do is have our team five moderate the Q&A. So they'll just read the questions for you so you don't have to um, scroll through the chat. But thank you so much for a fascinating talk. And I think this uh, enlightens us and gives us a window, not only into dreams, but also experimental design and how neuroscientists come up with these amazing experiments to understand the brain better. So with that, yes, let me turn it over to team five. And um, if you guys wanna read out the questions for Dr. Pollard and then he can address them. Oh, sounds good. Um, thank you again, Dr. Pollard, for your amazing talk. Um, I'm going to go back to Yana's question about lucid dreaming. She asked, how close is lucid dreaming to hypnosis? And she's heard that you cannot be influenced to do anything you consciously are not willing to do. And is that true? And if so, why does this limitation change with lucid dreaming manipulation? Yeah, I think that generalization is probably true. And, uh, but I'm not sure exactly how similar lucid dreaming is to hypnosis. Maybe there's something going on that's similar, but um, in a normal lucid dream, there's no one suggesting you to do anything. You're sort of on your own and you've come up with your own uh, scenario about, you know, why did you want to be actually, so lucid dreaming can happen spontaneously. And a lot of kids might have lucid dreams because they have nightmares and they eventually realize, oh wait, this nightmare, it's just a, it's just a dream and I'm going to wake up right now, or, or maybe even better. They might decide I'm going to go now that I know it's a dream, I'm going to go to talk to the monster that's tracing, chasing me or, you know, face confront, whatever the issue is and try to figure out, you know, why is it here in my dream and deal with it. So, you know, so lucid dreams can be a, a, a strategy for coping with nightmares and, or it can happen from people that just desire lucid dreams and they can, you know, go through some efforts. There are a lot of books about it. You know, what can you do to make lucid dreams happen more frequently? So, so, so yes, that's a little different than hypnosis where someone's giving you a suggestion and you're going along with it, kind of playing, playing along with it and, and maybe losing a little of your, your own volition. It's, it, at least it seems that someone else is controlling what you want to do. And you've kind of, you kind of handed over the volition for, to them 
to, to take charge of the things. So maybe, I don't know, another parallel is, I suppose in a dream, you don't seem to have volition in the sense of making things happen. But in a lucid dream, you get a little of that back and you can say, okay, now that I know this is a dream, I can decide what's going to happen. And, you know, it's going to be daytime now, or I'm going to be in Hawaii now. <laughs> and you can, you can kind of change the context and make different things happen. So I don't know, is that enough of the, the parallels? I'm not sure if there's something else you were thinking about from hypnosis that you wanted to connect to. I think that's a pretty good, good. answer <laughs> to the question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so the next question is from me. And I asked, I've seen an increasing interest in hallucinogenic drugs to treat mental disorders. Are there any similarities between the hallucinogenic experience psychedelics offer and lucid dreaming in regards to brain activity or, or how susceptible people are to changing habits? Yeah, I, I agree with the premise. There is a lot of interesting research in that area now, and it's sort of a growth area. Uh, and, and how, to, but actually, what is the parallel you're thinking of? I mean, I, I've kind of thought about one, one parallel, one thought I had, which was that if you're doing one of these controlled studies with the hallucinogenic experience, you could then, after the experience, revisit that state in your lucid dream. So you could kind of, you know, if you can control your lucid dream, you could say, I want to get back to that, explore that experience again, but this time without any drug induced state, but kind of a mentally induced state. And, and that's, you know, you're, you can kind of do that in your imagination. So imagination is like dreaming a little bit, daydreaming a little bit, you know, I can kind of close my eyes and imagine I'm somewhere else and go through an experience, but really it's a lot weaker than a dream, because a dream, you have this immersion, you have this kind of full virtual reality. It's not just the virtual reality with visual stuff, but it's all the senses of virtual experience, you know, the original virtual reality. And it's, so it's a lot different than daydreaming in that sense. It's got sort of more to it. And you can kind of, you can kind of really, you know, in fact, you're fooled most of the time in thinking it's a waking experience, it's that real. So. Uh, um, all right, but I've lost the track of how else did you want to connect that to hallucinogenic experiences? Well, I was mainly thinking like, um, I remember like lucid dreaming can be used to, to help like cigarette smokers and, and that, that type of thing. And I was also wondering, cause I've seen certain drugs used to uh, treat depression and PTSD and mental disorders. I was wondering if there's like a parallel between the certain brain, I, I, parts of the brain that are activated or like how you how how you're sort of subconsciously maybe manipulated so that you um uh can can heal from these these mental disorders yeah yeah i think they're kind of they're kind of potential opportunities there so if i think about our normal sleep most of us you know we may not remember our dreams or we might remember a dream or two but we don't really know what our brain has been busy at the whole night. And so I think if you have uh, depression or anxiety, you might spend your day worrying about things or feeling negative thoughts. And if you spend your day doing that, I would guess you're spending your night doing it too. And maybe we can shift the night behavior to be better. So if you're, you know, and it could, it, Sometimes, you know, poor sleep is like an extra symptom of some of these disorders, certainly in depression and PTSD. Poor sleep is part of the problem, but is it actually contributing to the disorder? Is it not just another symptom, but is it actually, you know, exacerbating the thing because you're spending, you know, eight hours a night obsessing about the stuff that's bothering you and you wake up and it's, you know, it's right there. So could we unhook that? Could we with you know, sounds during sleep, for example, push that around so that you unhook from the negative thoughts and extend gravitate to some more healthy ways of thinking. So I think there's, there's potential for uh, understanding what our mind's doing during sleep better and then asking, can we improve on that in cases when it's suboptimal, like perhaps in these disorders that you mentioned. And so I think that's, that's maybe a parallel to the studies of with hallucinogenic ideas, but but really in a different world and and something that's it's happening every night as our our brain is continuing to work with things. So um, 
going back to what I said earlier about having good sleep every night, you know, the, the standard story has been, well, you need at least seven or eight hours of sleep. And if we monitor your sleep, we could say, how much slow wave sleep are you getting and how much REM sleep are you getting? And let's be sure you're getting enough. And are your slow waves good enough? Because, uh, you know, you guys are pretty young, but when you get to be in your 20s and 30s, slow waves get smaller in amplitude. And in fact, it's not quite as effective. And that decline in slow wave uh, sleep is perhaps related to declines in, in cognitive functions in aging. And so, um, these are all the usual dimensions of thinking about how sleep is healthy and sleep, you know, slow wave may, sleep may also help flush out uh, uh, chemicals that you need to get rid of in your brain. So that's an interesting idea. It's called, um, it's, it's kind of like the lymphatic system of the brain. So it's called the glymphatic system. And it's being studied to see is that part of how you might clear amyloid that helps you, you know, from Alzheimer's disease and such. So there's a lot of ways sleep might be important. And the one I was getting to is, it's not just how much slow wave sleep you have, but it's what memories are you bringing up and how are you processing those memories? So even a more fine grained idea of, you know, what's happening during sleep to make your brain function well when you're awake. And it's not just the number of minutes of slow wave sleep, but it might even be what type of memory processing are you doing? And we haven't had a handle on that because we haven't figured out how to exactly measure that happening. But now that we have new, new methods, we're looking more about how to, how could sleep be more efficient? You know, what ideas maybe we could get good sleep in fewer hours, and then you could have all that time, you know, to do the other things you want to do while you're awake. But even if we can't make it more efficient, we could understand, well, how to make it function better. So I think that's, you know, those are exciting ideas for the future that uh, we're working with. All right, yeah. Well, our next question is from Neil S. And he asks, are there any physical differences in the veins of people with mental conditions that affect memory like ADHD and a normal person's brain? Yeah, um, and it's tricky. You know, there, there are lots of interesting studies about the brain differences in different disorders. Um, you know, schizophrenia is another example where we we're, we're still don't understand the disease quite well enough, but clearly there there are differences in the brains and there are differences in cognitive functions and even in motor functions that we're trying to figure out, well, how does that relate to the symptomatology that's defining this disorder? And is there some connection that could be helpful that we could work on and, and maybe even identify the difficulties earlier on and be able to treat them before the symptoms become problematic? So, uh, so, so you're, you're hitting on you know, a huge aspect of neuroscience of, you know, can we understand the, the neuroscience of these psychiatric disorders of various sorts and and then be able to do better with treatment or even prevention. So um, there's, there's a lot to say about that, but I think it's sort of, you know, open question that we, we that those, those problems haven't quite been cracked yet. So there's still a lot of look at, so with, in fact, it's, it's part of like what I was saying a little earlier, which of the, which of the brain changes are the ones that were causes of the disorder and which of the brain changes might be reflections of the disorder, you know, additional problems that happen after the disorder. So, so seeing the brain changes and the correlations is, a, is an interesting hint and part of the evidence, but it doesn't necessarily pinpoint the etiology and exactly, you know, what caused the disorder in the first place. It could just be a ramification of the disorder. So, um, so that the, the hunt continues to try to figure out the causes of these things. Um, the next question comes from me. Um, there's a paranormal game called Red Door, Yellow Door. Not sure if you've heard of it, but basically like people can fall into a kind of trance and other people who are awake can lead that person through a house and through different types of doors. And the person who's in the trance can like relay what he or she is seeing. And so I was wondering, how is lucid dreaming similar to or different from this? And how does the brain's cognitive functions or parts of the brain contribute to the person falling into a trance that can possibly even lead to trauma in this game? Because this game is known to be a little bit dangerous in terms of if you like see some something or someone, you could possibly stay in that like different dimension forever. Yeah, I, I don't know about that specific example much, but 
there is another example that's maybe similar, which is sort of a, a dream trance state that the, the writers in the, in the uh, tradition of surrealism used in, in, in you know, almost hundred years ago in France. And they described uh, kind of a shared experience where a person would enter this trance and in this, in the, in the goal would be some creativity, you know, creating some other uh, uh, creative result from, from getting in this trance. So, you know, it was used and then in that context and, and what state were they really in? Well, I would say, well, I needed to have electrodes on their heads to know something about, you know, were they asleep? In fact, were they in some other state? And so I, it's hard to speculate on what was going on. But let me connect it, let me make another connection with, with your question, which is um, what kind of information is, is available to people? And if it's in a paranormal context, I can suggest that one aspect of that might be implicit memory. So I talked about implicit memory in our studies of that. And that's uh, the idea that there's some knowledge that you don't know you have. And uh, given that you don't know the source of the knowledge, you might think that it's coming from somewhere magical because it seems to you know, materialize here without any reason that you can put your finger on for where it came from. But implicit knowledge, you know, actually another word is intuition. <laughs> Do we have intuition sometimes? Is it coming from, uh, uh, just a lucky guess? Well, sometimes maybe, but it could also be coming from knowledge that you've acquired and it's in the category of implicit knowledge. So you don't realize you have that knowledge and it gets produced and it seems to come out of nowhere. It's, it's sort of like inspiration or in sense, or, you know, intuition can, you know, our intuitive judgments can be quite on target and they might be on target because our brains are pretty clever and they've incorporated a lot of information and some of its implicit knowledge that we we can't pinpoint where it came from but it's you know real information that was acquired perhaps you know when we weren't quite paying attention but yet the information comes in and we we can use it later so i think that's an interesting angle to sort of think about how our how our you know something that might seem paranormal could be intuitive and entirely real but with a mechanism that we don't understand quite and, and in fact can't access in the normal way we would access memories that are conscious ones. Thank you, that makes sense. So our next question is from Kate and she asks, how do I figure out the ideal length of sleep for myself? Do you have any tips for falling asleep? Well, are you a coffee drinker? Do you take a lot of caffeine? No, I do not. I okay, do. interestingly. So, you know, one of, the, one of the tests people ask is a sleep latency test. So it's, you know, in the afternoon, if you sit in a dark room listening to a lecture, how quickly do you fall asleep? <laughs> and if, you know, if you fall asleep quite quickly, that's probably a sign that you're not getting enough sleep. You know, how often do you get sleepy in, in meetings or, you know, in class, classes or in other situations like that? And if you are getting sleepy, that's a sign. Um, well, you could take it as, well, that's a sign I better have more coffee. <laughs> Another interpretation was, well, that's a sign that you're really not getting enough sleep. And, and so some people don't feel that sign because they're caffeinated and they sort of overcome their sleepiness that way. But that, you know, that may not be a perfect solution. It may not actually give you the optimal performance that you would have if you weren't caffeinated and were surviving on the uh, sleep that you did get. So, so yes, the premise is right that not everyone needs the same amount of sleep. And so I really like your empirical suggestion is, well, how can I test it to see how much sleep I need? And so the sleep latency test is sort of one of the, one of the thoughts about it. It's, it's not necessarily the best one. So I, I wish we had a better one, but I think, you know, the, as usual, that the ramifications are, well, are things working out for you okay? And, you know, if you're getting along fine, maybe don't worry about it. You know, maybe, maybe you know, I, I think one of my items on my, my slide about sleep was, you know, don't, don't, don't get obsessed about having a certain amount of sleep. Uh, you know, it's not worth that kind of anxiety. And so it might be better off to, to sort of, um, do what you can, but don't, you know, don't, you know, if you actually get less sleep one night, uh, adding worry on top of it isn't gonna do you any good. 
Is that is that all right? Does that does that um, somewhat yeah. of an answer for you? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually really helpful. I was curious about that too. Um, so our next question is from Ananya, and she asks, is it possible to forget everything that occurred before a specific event or injury and have only impaired episodic or and long-term memory following that? Yeah, I'm not sure where you're coming from with that question, but the quick answer is yes, it's possible because of exactly the 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 thing I threw in there about psychogenic amnesia. <laughs> so, so, so the fact that people can forget their whole life and have amnesia that's that's not like EPs at all. It's not like organic amnesia. It's not like hippocampal damage, but it's more of a psychiatric issue. Uh, tells me that anything's possible. You know, you can have all of a sudden have a split personality, and you kind of have two beings inside of you. I mean, that's just a bizarre sort of thing. It doesn't happen. It's more like hypnosis. It doesn't happen unless you believe it could happen. And the type of amnesia people get when it's psychogenic amnesia is partly a function of what they think is possible. So that tells me it's more of a creation, uh, perhaps unconsciously. So perhaps not volitionally or perhaps kind of a little mix of intentional forgetting and simulating and hypnosis and sort of a combination of things so so my first answer is anything is possible <laughs> but maybe you had more in mind in that question so so can we, yeah. can we go back to it there's a follow-up question saying um what do you think about the way memory is presented in the movie inside out yeah well there's a lot of movies to talk about that are pretty interesting and and how amnesia is typically represented because amnesia is often misrepresented as, you know, you forget your whole life. And that's not the common type of amnesia. It's it's one, a little bit of retrograde amnesia, anterograde amnesia as well. Uh, and, uh, but that didn't happen in that film. So that, that film had like the five little emotions that are in your brain running around. And then was it like memories are like these little marbles and they're stored somewhere and you can go find them or they get lost, that aspect of things. So, you know, there's, there's, you know, I think that that it's sort of your frame of mind of whether you, you're bothered by how much leeway they take in that. So I think, you know, memories aren't stacked up uh, and organized in a way like, you know, if I think about photographs I take, each of the memory, each of the photographs is stored in my computer with a date stamp. Then I can say, get me this photographs that a particular date or that has a particular face in it. And our, our memories aren't indexed with a number system, they're rather content index. So, you know, our memories, if I say, think about ninth grade and you kind of go back to, okay, what classes did I have in ninth grade? Who were my friends? And you can kind of zero in on stuff and eventually step-by-step step, get to something specific you're looking for. So we have to kind of go through the retrieval process step-by-step step to gradually access some information. And, and I would say not all information is there. So if you think that everything that happened to you is in your head somewhere and with the right hypnosis or something, you could get to any memory, I'd say, I don't think so, but it's hard to, it's hard to prove that because <laughs> you could say, well, I, I just failed this time, but eventually I could get to that memory. So is every memory there? The reason I have a hunch that that's not the case is because how I think about consolidation and development. So consolidation is changing memories a little bit. So, you know, we change the memories and, and that's how you kind of get false memories sometimes. So you sometimes believe something happened that it didn't really happen because the memory changes over time. And I think that's part of consolidation that memory storage means integrating with other things and making some generalizations and some assumptions that lead people to sometimes misremember something. Or you might, you might imagine an event and then later on remember that experience but forget that one feature. Well, I imagined that whole thing. If you forget that feature, you're all of a sudden remembering something that was an imagined event and thinking it was a real one and it really wasn't. So that happens, that's been documented, can happen. Uh, and the other thing is, you know, most of us don't remember much from our early childhood, say the first four or five years. You know, if you ask people their earliest memories, it might be age three or four, usually around that area. So is our brain, 
capable of storing memories during those first five years? Well, I think so. You know, talk to a, a baby, you know, play around with a with an infant. They they have memories for things that happened the day before. But our memories are kind of superimposed on our knowledge of the world. And the think of the worldview of a three or four year old. It's not the same as ours as adults. It's not as sophisticated. It's sort of restricted. And then in the coming years, it changes dramatically. So our memories for events are kind of superimposed on our concepts of the different people and what it means to have this event and all that. And as that changes, as we grow from five to 10 to 15, uh, we have an entirely different worldview and we can't really get back to that. What was it like to be a three-year-old? and not know all the things I know now. That sort of basis of knowledge of the world is kind of gone as it gets expanded. So that's why we can't revisit those events in the past, not very sophisticated way, not, not very fully. And so, so, this is, so my thinking is that memories change over time and uh, we, re we may have memories for a lot more than we think we do if you kind of get the right probe and get to it, but we don't keep everything. Here's another example. I mean, if if in your early childhood you had a, a a frightful experience with a dog, dog chased you, and you were three years old and you got scared, and you might maintain a fear of dogs in as into adulthood, but you may not have an episodic memory of that experience. And you know, the old Freudian idea would be: well, if you want to overcome that fear, you need to make that unconscious experience conscious again. But I don't think there is a, you know, I think that conscious, that episodic memory is gone because it's embedded in what you thought about dogs and the world and everything in the old days. But that conditioned association of that fear can be maintained. So I don't think we need to go back. You know, we, we may want to analyze our fears and figure out, well, where is that coming from and how can I overcome it? But the, the early instantiation of it in that episode isn't necessarily stored in a way that you could just get with hypnosis. So the danger is if you if you try to pursue that, your hypnosis might produce memories you just created, new false memories. And that's the danger of therapists that use that method is they can implant a memory for some trauma that didn't actually happen. And if you're struggling with some current problems and trying to seek these old, you know, sources of them in, in episodes from your childhood, you're just as likely to perhaps manufacture some childhood episode that didn't really happen and that's not gonna help anybody. So I think that's that's part of the danger of digging up these old memories. Well, okay, so I've, I've taken the movie reference and gone on about a bunch of things. I think I that's my answer to your question. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Um, we actually have a lot of questions left. So um, maybe if it's possible uh, for the rest of the questions, can you give maybe a briefer answer? Like we really appreciate all the detail you've been um, giving us. Do we have another half hour? Is that right? Um, we'll probably go to about 12.45 because um, that'll allow participants to have a break before their next session. Okay, 15 minutes. But this has been, okay. I will be Yeah, brief. this has been wonderful. <laughs> okay, um, our next question comes from Anushe and she's asking, is it possible for someone under stress to develop insomnia and can it be related to PTSD or anxiety related conditions? If yes, how is that so? Yes, I mean, there, there are a number of reasons for insomnia. So it's, it's kind of one term, but there are lots of different subtypes of insomnia. And so I can't generalize about, you know, what are all the different ways you can have insomnia, uh, but there are good therapies for insomnia. So, you know, look into, you know, like mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction, mindfulness-based uh, approaches to uh, uh, insomnia can be very helpful. Uh, yeah. Thank you. The next question is from me and I ask, do you ever think we'll come to a point where we can record our lucid dreams and then watch them like a movie in the morning? Not like a movie, but I think there are possibilities. So I like your idea. There are possibilities of extracting a little bit more. So there's no headset you can put on and record your brain activity and then put it on somebody else and have them experience the same event. That's, that's still sci-fi. Um, but we can, I think, get more out of our lucid dreams and uh, with our signaling methods, I think we could 
basically save a little bit more of that experience so that you could use it if you're say an artist and you wanted to get more out of your lucid dreams so you could use you know have it infiltrate your art and there are some artists that do that <laughs> there, there i think there are more and more ways that we could extract information and sort of maintain it furthermore i think waking people up right after the lucid dream is is going to be helpful because if you stay asleep you know i think we have so many dreams at night and then we wake up in the morning and we don't remember very many but if you wake up right during the rem period and uh, try to recall your dream, you're, you're much more likely to not forget it. So I think there's some tricks to not forgetting dreams that we can take advantage of. So if you wanted to do that, is it valuable? That's another question. <laughs> not for everybody. I don't do that much myself, but it, I could imagine it could be valuable in some cases. So Dr. Park asks, when a person uses a sleep tracker app, what specific readouts should they pay attention to in order to determine whether they had a good night's rest? Yeah, you know, I'm afraid I'm going to have to say that most of the sleep trackers are pretty bad. They're not really measuring what we measure in the laboratory. So if we have the EEG, we have electrodes on the eyes and the chin, we get a full, you know, typical, it's called polysomnographic record. And a sleep tracker, if it's just on your wrist or even some of the headbands, they're trying to model that and they've used some cool machine learning to approximate it. But but don't believe everything you see. So, you know, I have also a ring app or a ring, which is kind of fun to monitor my sleep. But I know that it's not always right. And sometimes it says I'm asleep when I was actually awake, but just very still. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, it can't always be right. But but I think it's still helpful. So, you know, use the technology, see what it what it can do for you. But uh, but my 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 message is that you know, the sleep tracking can be helpful to kind of let you know if you're getting good sleep or not getting good sleep. Did, you know, having coffee late at night, did that mess you up? Or having alcohol, did that mess it up? So great for trying to monitor things and get better sleep, but not, you know, not, a, not the gold standard of really whether your sleep was good or not. Um, Ardell asks, is there a reason for that we sometimes get the feeling that something we thought happened in real life is actually a memory from our dreams. Yeah, that can be the case. I mean, there's there's sort of, you know, even a deja vu experience is sort of a funny blip where something seems familiar and you're not sure why. So um, dreaming could be part of that. And that's been hard to investigate scientifically, right? If, we, if you're, you're only knowing after the fact, you can't, you can't really pinpoint that very well, but I, I certainly would put it in the realm of possibilities that sometimes, you know, we might remember a little bit of dreams. I think, you know, we don't remember that much of dreams probably adaptively, because if you remembered a lot of dreams and didn't know that they were dreams, you think a lot of things happened and you might be, you know, mad at your friend for what they did with you to you and realize, no, they didn't actually do that at all. It was a dream. So keeping them separate has its, has its good side. Our next question comes from Dr. Park, and the question is, do animals like dogs and cats dream? Yeah, it looks pretty, pretty clear that they must, uh, but of course we don't have the same dream reports from them. But in terms of the physiology, a lot of the same thing is happening. You can see REM sleep and you can see motor, uh, uh, you know, the, the same kind of a restriction of motor activity, uh, sometimes leaking through. And so, you know, anyone that has a dog or a cat sometimes can, can imagine they must be dreaming. Now, what do they think about their dreams? That's a fascinating question because, you know, they, they kind of must understand that there's two worlds and sometimes they're in the dream world and things happen and sometimes they're in their house again and it's a different world. But I don't know what kind of concepts they have to kind of understand their dreams or, or what they dream about. But it's, it's fun to think about that and figure out if there are ways we could understand it better. Yeah. So our next question is from Janice, and it alludes to what you were talking about, about lucid dreaming nightmares and waking yourself up from it. But anyways, she says, sometimes when I have nightmares, I know that I'm dreaming and can tell myself to open my eyes. How does the brain give muscles like the eyelids commands to open during lucid dreaming? Yeah. yeah, we're studying that a little bit. I mean, the commands to move your eyes seem to work just fine. So move your dream eyes. And as we've shown your actual eyes move too. So, you know, that's not true for the rest of your body, but it's true for your eyes, which I think, you know, don't, don't, they're not in danger of waking you up. Whereas if you move your limbs, it's probably going to disturb your sleep. 
uh, but eyelids, it's a little different. And so we've, we've kind of asked in, in an ongoing experiment, Karen Conkley is doing, what happens in a lucid dream when you open and close your eyes? Because your eyes aren't actually open and closing, your dream eyes are opening and closing. And we can look at the visual cortex and see, well, what do we see alpha rhythms? What, what changes in the brain responses do we see when you're seeing or not seeing things during your sleep? And uh, not everyone seems to be able to open their eyes and wake up. So some people have a lucid dream and they open their dream eyes, but their actual eyes don't open. <laughs> or they don't actually wake up. So it seems to be inconsistent about, you know, the eyelid opening part and whether you have control over that or whether you can do it. And so that, that hasn't been investigated, but it's a really cool kind of phenomenon to, to think about further. So thanks for that question. Um, so this next question comes from Noel, and I think it's referring to those experiments where the researchers were communicating with um, sleeping individuals. So she's asking, does the communication during REM sleep influence the quality of sleep that individuals get? Okay, well, I can back up a little bit and say, what about just having a lucid dream? Because some people who like to lucid dream decide that they don't want to do it every night because they don't quite feel as rested if they've had a lot of lucid dreams. So there might be some extent to which a lucid dream is different in some sense like that. Uh, we don't have enough examples of communication to know. Uh, Basically, it's more exhilarating. So, you know, we go to people go to sleep and they say, you know, we're going to try to communicate with you with in their sleep, and it doesn't always work. And when it does, everybody's finding that fascinating that they could actually do this communication, or or you know, they could actually do the math problem when they thought you know they weren't sure if they could do it. So, the exhilaration is probably the biggest <laughs> repercussion. Uh, and I think we don't know yet is, and it's an ongoing question either from, from our other studies too. Are there things that detract from the restorative functions of sleep? You know, are there, are there ways that you don't feel as rested? And we don't really have a handle on that yet, although it seems like it's, it's not, you know, it's not obvious that there's a big problem with, with uh, lucid dreaming or communication in, in terms of restfulness. Thank you. So our next question comes from Derek and Noel, and they ask, can blind people dream? And a similar question from Alvin is, can people with aphantasia dream? Yeah, you'll have to remind me what aphantasia is, but blind people for sure uh, are having dreams. And, you know, the, the, the interesting, th it's interesting though, that dreams are very visual in most people that, you know, you, you, you might taste things or you might hear things, but the, the majority of dreams seems to be focused on what's happening visually. And so that seems to be a big part of sleep and you know the people who are blind they still have spatial knowledge so uh, that's not visual knowledge mind you because they don't have vision if it's if it's from birth but they have spatial knowledge and they know their way around places so you know that's that's sort of an aspect of you know thinking about the world and the environment that's that's probably going to be part of dreaming even though to me it's hard to imagine i mean all of us who are sighted it's hard to imagine having never been sighted and, and harder still to imagine what is spatial knowledge if it's not visual. Because every time I think of spatial knowledge, you know, I think about walking in the street or somewhere. I think about it in a visual way. But I know also that blind people have spatial knowledge that's not the same. What is it? So that, that, that stumps me at the moment. I think that's, that's really, really a, a conundrum. Um, Dr. Pollard, so aphantasia is like a disorder when someone can't create like mental images in I their mind. That's so right. So, how... mm -hmm. so yeah, I, I, and I think also people with deficits in their visual imagery also don't have as much dreaming. So yeah, the you're you're on an important track there. That's that's on target. That the the ability to imagine things and have mental images that seems just such a natural thing for most of us, but some people don't have that and they don't have rich mental imagination. Uh, uh, that's, that's in line with, with the dreaming phenomenon. And also, yeah, I think that's an important connection there. So our next question is a more general question from Salil. And he's asking, is memory something that can be trained and improved? Oh yeah. 
yeah, I, I, you know, I think that's the message of brain brain plasticity in general. So, you know, we talked about how neurons change and they change in their connections and the connection strengths between neurons. And this is the whole network of neurons is changing. And that's the plasticity of, of learning that's at the basis of our ability to learn. And, and yes, you can improve it in so many ways. So, you know, some of that's about strategies that you use. If, if I'm not sure if the question is about, um, if you have difficulty with some sorts of memory, can you get better at it? But 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 for sure that's true. I mean, even if a lot of people say, "Oh, I have I have poor memory for faces, or poor memory for names," uh, and th those are just harder things to remember because faces are generally similar <laughs> across people, and so you have to uh, come up with good strategies for remembering faces and names. And you can, and you can sort of develop uh, better abilities by working at something. So yeah, I think that's sort of the whole message of the, the plasticity is that uh, growth is possible. And you know, you can teach an old dog new tricks and all kinds of things like that. It's possible to continue to learn and to improve at something that you're not initially good at. And so I think, you know, most of you must already have that ability that you're good at some things, you're not good at other things. And if you just decide not to do those other things because you're not initially good you're sort of cutting off possibilities because you know with effort you can get good at other things and that's having a growth mindset very important in education um our next question comes from kyle um he's asking do lucid dreamers always remember their dream and then a kind of similar question although more general probably not limited to just lucid dreamers from mika what determines how many dreams we have during the night and what determines which dreams we can remember? Yeah, okay, Kyle. Well, um, the, the, the first part about lucid dreaming is so if you wake up and realize you had a lucid dream, then, then you're succeeding in remembering it. But, but your question is, are there lucid dreams that we have and then don't remember them? And I don't know how we've ever been able to answer that before, but our research answers that. <laughs> so not in our paper, but uh, we had communication succeed in some people, they answered a math problem and then we woke them up and they didn't remember having answered. But I'm pretty sure they answered because we have the data there that they, they made the eye movement. And I kind of think, you know, math problems are complex enough that you don't just do it reflexively without knowing what you're doing. So I think the lucid dream must have happened and sometimes people don't remember them. So from that evidence, I can say, yeah, I think it's not the case that every lucid dream is automatically remembered because your brain's in a different state, which was a possibility. I think some lucid dreams aren't remembered. And so maybe all of us have lucid dreams and we just don't have the benefit of remembering. So your other general question was, well, so what determines that? And I, I, I think, um, you know, the interesting experience about a dream that I've had is, you know, when you wake up from a dream, you might remember, oh, I just had this amazing dream and you seem to have the knowledge of the dream, but in a moment it can go away and you can forget a large part of the dream unless you kind of go through it in your mind. So I think our working memory functions of, of re revisiting the dream right when you wake up allows us to store that dream quite effectively. And if you don't do that, you, you sort of, your brain state during the dream isn't necessarily in a storage type of mode to store the memory. I think you're in a better storage mode when you wake up. So I think, momentarily awakening or prolonged awakening after the dream is what determines whether you're gonna remember that dream. So if you're a good sleeper and you stay asleep, you're not gonna remember your dreams. And that's a sign of good sleep, in fact. And if you instead, you know, the, and there's, there's waking up where you're fully awake and there's also something called a micro arousal where you kind of momentarily go into the wake state and then go right back to sleep and don't even remember waking up. And so I think these, you know, even brief micro arousals might allow you to store some of the memory of the dream and then have that memory that you can recall later. Uh, so, so if you want to remember your dream, you can think of, you know, you can spend more effort. And, and actually when you, the moment you wake up, instead of opening your eyes and getting up, if you close your eyes, keep your eyes closed and lay there a while, sometimes the memory will come to you and you'll sort of after a few seconds be able to remember a dream that at first you can't remember. So I think a lot of us don't remember dreams because we just move into our waking state right away and get preoccupied with stuff. And <laughs> We're starting to think about all these other things and there's no room for that dream to kind of come in 
and get rehearsed and get into working memory. So strategies can be used to, and also, you know, if you had an, a, a little gadget that woke you up at the end of a REM period, you'd wake, like we do in the laboratory, you could wake up, wake up and have more dream recall. So yeah, I think dream recall is systematic in that sense. It seems kind of random, uh, but it's partly a, a function of what brain state we're in after we finish REM periods. Yeah, so uh, our next question comes from Kyle. And the question is, how would you alter the experiment for people who are deaf? Well, uh, a lot of the work with our targeted memory reactivation has done with odors. So I would shift to odors. Odors are fine cues. Even a strong odor doesn't wake people up. So it has that advantage. And presenting odors to people can kind of do a lot of the same things that sounds can do. I, I tend to use sounds in my work because of the different opportunities of things uh, to present. But I have co collaborators at the med school here that study olfaction. And so we're now working together with them on some olfactory studies. So, and you know, if not olfaction, tactile stimulation or visual stimulation, I mean, these are all possibilities too. So I, I like the auditory stuff for reasons, but it's not the only way. Okay, our next question is from Rishabh and he asks, since sleep deprivation can be harmful to mental processes, how long or extreme does your sleep deprivation need to be until it reaches irreversible mental changes? Yeah, I'm not sure how ir irreversible in death, I guess, and so, but yeah, there, there, I, I think it might be reversible, but it, an interesting fact about that is that making up for poor sleep isn't so easy. You know, one, like if, you, if you're not getting sleep well for five days during the weekday, you don't really make it up on the weekends just by getting more sleep. So I think there's sort of an accrual of short sleep that takes longer than just one good night of sleep to make up. Uh, so, so, so for that reason, the, the sleep hygiene advice is wake up at the same time seven days a week. Don't have you know, these sleeping in periods because that just sets your rhythms off and then you don't fall asleep as well the next night and it's, it's not good for you. It's better to have consistent wake and sleep times. Um, but, oh, did I miss part of your question? I think it mostly hits on it, but just like how, I know it, or it didn't really hit on the crux of it of like, until you have like mental changes that- yeah. Well, yeah, so sleep deprivation is bad for you. There are plenty of studies of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I don't know if there are good studies of saying exactly how much sleep de deprivation is like really bad for you <laughs> or, you know, and it, how does it accrue? And I think that probably varies from person to person too. So the general, the general answer might not apply to each person. Um, but, but yeah, I think we, we can kind of say there are a lot of repercussions of sleep deprivation and, and it, you know, there's different types of that. There's pulling an all-nighter and not getting any sleep. And then there's just getting only four hours of sleep day after day after day that also is, is quite harmful. And so, yeah, they're both bad and they, they both can't necessarily be made up immediately. And I, yeah, sometimes you might have to do it. I confess, sometimes I had to work all night on something to get some, a grant done or something like that in, in my younger days. So it can happen and you pay a price for it and you kind of have to decide, is that worth it? And, and I guess from a memory point of view, if, if you have a, an exam the next day, staying up all night to cram may or may not be the right thing to do because getting the sleep might really help you perform better the next day and do well, you know, be alert and, and be able to retrieve the information you need to retrieve. So, so I, I wouldn't recommend all nighters right before an exam if that's what you're thinking. So we have one final question and this comes from Edward. And the question is, I've read that there's a sweet spot of sleep around 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. that provides higher quality of sleep. Is this true? And if so, how does that affect those with altered circadian rhythms like night shift workers? Yeah, so right, the, the truth is circadian rhythms are an important factor of sleep. And so a lot of people, some of my colleagues here, they study both sleep and circadian rhythms because they interact a lot and they're important. So we do have these rhythms, you know, that's why an afternoon nap can sometimes be timed right because your body is in the right rhythm to do that. And again, that's, that's why the recommendation of going to sleep the same time and waking up the same time every day is helpful because then it kind of gets into your rhythm. So you're in the right circadian rhythm. So this is 
Uh, again, of course, the problem with jet lag, when you move to another time zone, you, your body can't shift its circadian rhythms, you know, like that. So, uh, you know, some advice to, for example, um, you know, major league pitchers, if you're going to go across country and you have a three hour time difference, you need to take that into account and start shifting in advance. Like you can shift one hour a day and get into a, a, a different time zone gradually. And of course you're influenced by the light dart cycle. So you want to, you know, wear sunglasses if you're going to need to, you know, not get bright light when it's going to mess you up and your meal time influences your circadian rhythm. So there's a lot of circadian factors that are important in our bodily rhythms that inter interact with whether our sleep is going to be effective or not. And definitely taking those into account is good. And I'm not sure, I guess a sleep spot is the right way to think about it perhaps, but it's sort of a flexible one because it changes with your circadian rhythms and your circadian rhythms are controlled by really interesting uh, biological mechanisms that, that can be adjusted and, and are pretty important to keep in mind too. So that's, that's really an essential part of thinking about sleep. So I'm glad you brought that up. Excellent. Thank you very so much. We're gonna close it out there. And thanks to all the participants for those provocative questions. I think we really could have gone on and on and gotten a lot of um, uh, good advice from Dr. Poller about how to regulate and manage our sleep, as well as all of his amazing research, which you can see from the discussion, everyone, how um, practical and applicable all of this um, research is that is done in the lab. So we wanna thank you again, Dr. Poller. Maybe we can have some uh, digital emoticon reactions from everyone and we will close it out there. I will end the 